third of three ACPE virtual town hall meetings regarding consolidation with AAPC. Um, we're really glad you're here. We in the past have begun these by introducing the executive committee and we are down by one. Um, so there are only two of us to introduce. Um, I will introduce myself first and then I'll tell you why the third member is not here and then, uh, then Melissa will introduce herself. I'm Reverend Dr. Amy Green. I always have to say it that way. Um, I'm the Director of Spiritual Care at the Cleveland Clinic and I'm the current board chair through this end of this year. Um, I think that's about all for now. Linda Wilkerson is our first ever combined secretary treasurer starting this year. And uh, she is not with us today because her father died a couple of days ago. He um, was, had been ill for quite some time and she was spending lots of good time with him. And she, I think they had a very peaceful final few days. So as much as she will miss him, it was as, I think as good a death as most of us can hope for. She would not mind all of you knowing it's in the ACPE news this morning. So with that, I'll turn it over to Melissa to introduce herself. Okay. Uh, can I say one word about Linda? <clears throat> She's the director of pastoral care and yes. um, education at Parkland Health and Hospital Systems in Dallas. Thank you. Um, so I'm Melissa Walker Luckett. I'm an ACPE certified educator. I'm an ordained um, Baptist woman. My affiliation is with the Alliance of Baptists. And I am chair elect for the remainder of this year and will become chair in January of 2020. Um, it's been my pleasure to work with great folks in ACPE. Thank you. And waving to us from the other corner is John Roach, who makes all things technical happen. So what we've generally done, and I see that we see that there's a lot of folks signed on today, so I hope that you all will be very interactive. Um, we'll give you just a few reminders. All of these are being recorded, so I don't know if you've seen the other two, um, but if not, if you want to see those. There's a lot of repetition in the questions, I think, so you, you may get them answered today. And feel free, even if you think we've answered it before, if it was not to your satisfaction, please ask it again. Um, please submit your questions by the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We had hoped for this to be a little more dialogical, but it just didn't turn out with the numbers of people that we're having. And then we will follow up with you um, afterward if there are any questions that we either don't get to or we simply don't know the answer. We will try to get the answer and get that posted as quickly as we can, and you can submit those to webmaster at acpe.edu. And once again, you can um, find most of this, a lot of this can, is already on the web page. We've uh, printed a good bit of the questions and answers and dialogue that's been going back and forth. It's been very productive, very fruitful, great questions. Sometimes somebody thinks of something every time that we haven't thought of, so that's why we're doing it. Um, thanks for co coming on board with us today. Um, let's get started. I think we might have, do we have any questions rolling through yet? Okay. Not yet. Okay. So one thing that, that came up in the last, um, the last one that we do not have an answer for yet, but it's a very, very good question came from Patrick McCoy, who is actually our incoming board chair for the foundation. He raised a very good question, which was that if all of the, if members who are joining as a, a, PC, if a, former AAPC members, if we vote to go ahead, they only they join one member at a time. There's no group coming on board. We don't get their mailing list dump or anything. People have to come on one at a time and decide independently to join ACPE. However, not every one of those people um, will have had CPE. So we were raising the question, what does it mean to be a member of CPE, ACPE without ever having had CPE? And so, um, for now, in terms of the current folks that have a current membership in AAPC, I think we sort of have to grandparent them in. I think going forward, we need to decide what do we, what kind of minimal requirement do we want of ACPE members, no matter what category they end up in professionally, um, educator, chaplain. If we if we ten, if we end up, you know, um, consolidating with the chaplaincy organizations. Um, therapists and counselors if we end up consolidating with AAPC. Those are all questions that remain to be figured out. And I think there's really good, uh, really good fodder for discussion in that question. Apologize, my phone is ringing. Um, that's one of the things that we will be working now um, as we go forward, if we do go forward. 
we what? have our first question. Yay! <laughs> the question is from Sally Schwab. It's a two-parter. What is the value for ACP in this merger, which to clarify, it's a consolidation. What is the value for ACP in this consolidation? And then the second part, what are the liabilities to the consolidation? You wanna take a swing at it this time, Melissa, or you want me to start? Yeah, go ahead and start. Okay, so what are the, what are the advantages to doing it? Yeah, so we've been very honest and so has AAPC. AAPC for many years has had to um, live with the fact that people don't actually have to join AAPC anymore. They are not certified through AAPC. They have to be licensed through their states and their independent states, and they pay a lot of money for different um, certifications. And so AAPC does not really need to exist in, in order for people to practice their art form. It's been more of a community, a large community of practice, if you will. So they are going under. At, they, at their current rate, they cannot sustain it. And that's part of why the conversations got started. However, when we began to talk with them about possibly consolidating, we were not interested in a purely a rescue mission. If something needs to go out of business, it needs to go out of business, and that's not, um, that's not a reason to do it. The way we look at it has been that they offer a great deal of history and uh, professionalism in terms of training. They share a lot of the same values. They share a lot of the same background in their training. Most, I would say most of them, easily most of them have done at least some CPE um, as part of their training and seminary degree and all that. I think we have a lot of things in common in terms of being cousins in the work of spiritual care and education. And just as they, just as we had to redefine uh, ourselves and we sort of rebranded under, still under ACPE to keep the name recognition, but to change our focus of how we describe who we are away from simply saying clinical pastoral education, but now saying the standard for spiritual care and education, that really applies to AAPC too. They were finding the same thing, that, that they were starting to need a new, a fresher way to talk about what they do that was not as dated maybe as the pastoral counseling, because as, as many of them have said, that they just, people who hear that think we, we counsel pastors or they counsel pastors. Anyway, they feel like they have a lot still to offer in terms of training therapists of all backgrounds, of all different training tracks, to offer a curriculum called Spiritually Integrated Psychotherapy. And it's very creative and would give, um, give people a certificate. It will not be certification, but it will be a certificate in Spiritually Integrated Psychotherapy so that social workers, psychiatrists, anybody who's licensed to practice psychotherapy in any form in their state could do these training programs that were uh, taught and initiated and um, and charged for by the, by the members of a formerly member members of what we think will be formerly AAPC, but will then become ACPE. Um, they will do these training curricula that will allow therapists to incorporate their own spirituality into their work and also to address the spirituality of their patients in a way they have not been able to do before. And we also think that once they're able to do this, we have a lot of um, we have a lot of uh, resources in terms of people to refer to. Um, we have resources in terms of helping us learn about the more in-depth aspects of our own outcomes that we maybe are not always as good about, the in-depth, extensive and intensive um, care to people that we are obliged by our own outcomes and standards to offer. And also, I'm excited personally, and I think many of us are, about adapting this curriculum. They're going to pilot it with psychotherapists, but I can see down the road having this spiritually integrated curriculum be offered to a variety of professionals, and especially in an institution like mine, I could see a group of nurses wanting to take this curriculum and a group of doctors wanting to take it. And it's, it will be much shorter and less exhaustive and expensive and in some ways prohibitive than, than a bona fide unit of CPE, but it'll give us some cross-pollination with some of our other colleagues and I think help us as a, as a movement of spiritual care givers and educators to um, strengthen our image to the, to the rest of the world. Um, so that's the great stuff. I think the second part was what are the disadvantages, right? Wait, can we? Please. 
<laughs> so a couple of other things I think are important to think about. In the past, because of the pastoral care movement, there have in the past been CPE, ACPE centers located in counseling centers where these folks have um, seen and worked with clients. And um, with ACPE centers potentially there, then our CPE students got a greater, broader spectrum in some ways. Um, and at least a very different environment than, say, only the hospital, only the hospital sort of environment. So there's a real hope that perhaps some of these folks who are becoming pastoral counselors will also think about um, moving toward having CPE themselves and then becoming uh, able to have accredited centers in counseling centers. Um, the, it'll help us with that outcome Linda always talks about of the intensive and extensive education around pastoral counseling. A and as Amy said, our referral sources will be uh, increased. Not only I think about for our patients and families, um, but also for our students who um, in the midst of ACPE sometimes need somebody else to talk to besides their CPE supervisor to sort things out. So that's it. That's all I got to say. So I think we were looking at downsides, Elsa? Yeah. Um, we also received a couple. What are the liabilities or drawbacks, downsides? Right. Yep. Right. Yeah. Well, we've certainly been doing a lot of talking about that. I think that what I hope everyone can feel very reassured about is that the folks they have, a, a, they have a million dollars still in their coffer. So they have very wisely decided to start looking at options before the ship sank. Um, so they're coming in with money to help hire any additional help that we will need in the national office to cover a lot of these ins and outs. This is a trial balloon. So we, we are not going to commit ourselves to bailing out an organization. If their membership if those folks don't join in sufficient numbers to warrant having their own person on staff and to and to maintain the work that will need to be done in their committees, then then we let it go out of business. I mean, it becomes it was a it was an it was a, an experiment. We do not put at risk the resources that are uh, have been to date exclusively ours. They will be, we will become it will become all of us, but there'll still be line items and budgets just as there are now within ACP. And we will not be risking any of that. People will be free to join. They'll be free to give to the fund. They'll be free to try to, you know, to not be nominated or nominate themselves for committees if they'd like. So we're hoping for a real rich kind of cross fertilization, but we're not, we're not taking any financial risks that we, we're just not taking any financial risks. I don't know how to say it. Um, I think the risks are that we'll fight and squabble and disagree. And I mean, and how's that any different from what we're doing now? <laughs> I don't feel that worried about it. I think that um, there's a lot of history of animosity to some degree, but I think those, that's really part of the past. And I really think, really think those days are behind us. Um, if our meetings together face to face are any indication, those, those are really, uh, way behind us. We're a lot more aware that we are stronger together as uh, colleagues in, as I said, in spiritual care and education. Um, there's not a direct swap over. Nobody's going to become certified in the, in the other person's profession just because we, just because we consolidated. I keep trying to get the right word. <coughs> no reciprocity. No reciprocity. There might be, there might be ways in which through collegial relationships, the process to become the other yeah, is available to other folks and there's support for that, but it's not going to be a, a, um, reciprocal. So that's really all I can think of. I, I know everybody can dream up potential what ifs, but truthfully, we just won't know until if and when we get there. The, they, they come with no debt as well. We're not taking on any financial burden um, and here's where we miss Linda to be able to talk at, at length about that, but they have no debt. They've been very, um, oh, considerate, uh, they've considered it determined to, to come without debt. And so we're not assuming any debt on their part. And actually they'll be bringing over transferring in some endowment funds. 
Right. So we'll figure out how to designate some of their ongoing work. Um, so kind of in a similar, similar to this line of talking, um, would AAPC members be open to joining communities of practice? As doing so, would they impact the budgets of the COP has? And that's from Dean Dyke. The, I want to say this. They already um, actually, in many ways, do practice in communities of practice. Um, <clears throat> and so in some ways, they might be a really good resource for us in how to establish and um, feed, uh, tend communities of practice. So uh, that's one thing I'm actually hopeful about, that they will bring some um, boots on the ground experience that we don't have yet. Um, budgetary wise, well, maybe. Um, and all communities of practice, as we've seen often in our group anyway, wish for more than we can have. And we learn to do with what we can, um, what, what we can afford. So I don't anticipate us having a big financial misbalance because of any communities of practice that they bring or that we form with them in terms of that cross-pollination and common interests across disciplines. I would agree with that. I think, I think that's going to be one of the, I would guess that's going to be one of the main places we see the cross-pollination is in the COPs because a lot of places are, let's face it, and a lot of CPE centers are far away from other CPE centers. A lot of counselors are far away from other counselors. And so to have that kind of collegial relationship in a more hopefully closer by and sometimes by the distance communication, but in whatever ways they form, I think there's real, uh, real possibility for that. There's up to preempt what is possibly another question. They have about 100, uh, 100, 1,100 members right now, but we don't expect anything like that number of people to come on over and join AP, ACPE because they'll have to do it one at a, one at a time. And a, a large fraction of those, maybe, maybe over half, maybe more, um, won't need to or want to continue in this new venture. They'll be mostly close to retiring. Maybe they I mean, it's fine if they do, but I'm just saying that the APC board doesn't seem to think it'll be a, a majority of folks wanting to make that switch. So we're not going to get inundated either with more new people or with tons of money, but they do come with money of their own to spend. So will members of AAPC pay for membership fee for affiliation? Yes. yes. They will. And the details of that are being worked out because, again, they have to pay their own licensure in their states. They all have to be licensed in various forms in their individual states where they practice. And that's pretty expensive. And for the most part, they don't work in centers like many of us do where our hospital or our institution helps or pays for our fees. And they don't have that. So, so there'll be a scale that's more equitable based on some of those considerations. But they will definitely pay membership. And it will be, it will be fair. Our next question is from Brian Conley. Will there be designated AAPC positions on the ACPE board or and other commissions? No. Do you want to take that one, Melissa? Or? Well, that's the answer that I have is no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, they may, because of um, their interests or their particular um, specialties want to have a committee of their own. Um, there hasn't been any talk to my recollection of a commission. Um, and after people, just like all of us in ACPE, after people have chosen to join the association and become active in the association, be known in the association, then they like all the rest of us can put our names in the hat for nomination for any committee um, that's that's out there and then the leadership development committee vets just will just like they do now vet all of those recommendations um, for leadership positions so it'll be um, they are going to pay dues they're going to be active as active as they choose to be just like all the rest of us and we'll be able to 
um, serve on committees. Now, the question has come up, well, what if they've never had CPE? Can they be on a CPE certification committee? And, you know, that that's a really good question and it doesn't make sense for someone who's not been an extensive CPE to be on that particular committee. Right. Might they be on an accreditation committee? You know, I think that's a really good possibility. Um, we have in the in the recent past, we've moved to having someone who's not an ACPE certified educator on those committees regularly. Um, and as a site team chair, sometimes those folks were the most insightful and gave us the best questions to ask um, and to evaluate for ourselves and our um, sites, our centers. So I hope that answers your question. You wanna add anything, Amy? No, I think that's great. We have a couple questions around ethics and ethics standards um, from Brian Conley and Sally. So I'm going to kind of group them together. Okay. Um, have we reviewed the ethical standards that AAPC members are held to? Are they substantially are they substantially similar to the ethical standards for ACPE? And how, if at all, will we manage their complaint process and ethics complaints? Great question. So yes and yes, we definitely are compatible and they definitely will have to agree to the ACPE ethics as we have them now. Um, one of the things that we're going on as a, as a great sort of model, I think, is that beginning in 2004, many of you know, I'm sure the two people who ask know this, we began a joint process with APC on dealing with our ethics and dealing with ethics complaints. And that was a pilot project back in 04. And it, in my understanding of it, and I've never heard anybody refute this, that has been an astonishing success. Um, and so looking at how to do that going forward with them, we would obviously need um, AAPC, formerly AAPC folks, um, in very much involved in whatever, uh, whatever ethics violations might come up for them. But I would think since they're not licensing anymore, I don't know. I think it would be, um, I think it would be well within what we know how to do to incorporate those into the processes that we already have, especially given this joint process that we have. I, I think, if not perfected, gotten pretty darn close in the last ten or more years, whatever that makes, fifteen now. And I'm not sure what uh, organizations they are responsible to within their licensing. Uh, within the circumference of their licensing. Um, so that would be another question, John, maybe that we need to look at is, of course it would be state by state, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, but there's probably a legal, ethical sort of thing with them as well as with us. Right, I, well, I agree. I think what whatever we would face would be subsumed by the process that they would have to go through to keep their licensure first and foremost. But, but I don't, I think we would have a good precedent for that. All right. Um, our next question is about dues from Sanja Delouch. Uh, if you are a member of both entities and in reading the information, they won't, sorry. If you're a member of both organizations and you've already paid your dues, your financial obligations to both organizations or to one or the other, Will that will they transfer when when the consolidation is done? Uh, uh, transfer. I mean, yes, you won't have to pay again. Um, but I think when you're when they when your ACPE dues come due, you will have to pay again. You won't have to pay both of them again. I wouldn't think because you're already a member of ACPE, a right? Okay, so if you're a member of APC and a member of ACPE, you have two dues. If and when AAPC dissolves, that one will go away and you will have your ACPE dues. Yeah. Um, I don't think that if you've already paid AAPC, they'll refund it to you. You just won't pay it the next time because you'll, your membership won't Sorry, have it anymore right. have to do anymore you would still need to pay your ACPE dues. Does that make sense? I think so. 
I just want to say one thing I, before I forget it, because Melissa mentioned the LDC, the Leadership Development Committee and how we'll be vetting people. For those of you who don't know, built into the new organizational design uh, work re reorganization was the fact that the board chair, after serving his or her two-year term, rotates into the leadership of that committee for two more years. So I'll be the Leadership Development Committee chair for 20 and 21, Melissa will be it for 22 and 23. So for the pretty pretty significantly near future, we'll have some real continuity with um, this whole conversation. Like we'll be very, very aware of what the history was and what the intentions were. And I think there'll be some, if that makes anybody feel any better, that we'll at least we'll have some history when we're trying to look at some of those things. That just occurred to me, even though yeah. nobody asked. Great thought. <laughs> All right, we have a question from Alex Lukens. His question is, will there be a center of competence for pastoral counseling supervision dialogue? How will this be similar to the ways things were before the split and how different? I asked him to clarify what he meant by the splits. Um, and he was saying, um, sorry, one second. Prior to the separate development of AAPC out of ACP in the 70s, 80s, when ACP focused specifically on supervision and education. So to clarify, AAPC did not split from ACPE. Both organizations formed independently in the 60s. Um, so there was no, we never split apart. We've always been two different organizations that have actually worked very collaboratively over the 50 year history. Um, now, the other part of his question was a center of competence for pastoral counseling supervision dialogue. I don't know. I mean, if that ends up being what they feel like they need, I think um, they're, again, they're not certifying anybody to do pastoral counseling, spiritually integrated psychotherapy even. Their curriculum for our spiritually integrated psychotherapy Again, even that is, is just, I hate to use that as though it's minimizing, but it's simply going to be a certificate, a certificate in this. It's not, even that's not a certification. But as a lot of those folks have told us, therapists like certifi certificates in XYZ because it helps bump up their game when they're trying to get clients and things. And it, and it helps them keep their continuing ed really robust and have some legitimacy to it. So um, there'll be commission, there'll be a committee, I'm sure, to oversee that uh, in, in whatever form or fashion their membership decides to keep overseeing that. But I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking. Um, they want, they're not supervising anymore. They don't, they, they don't supervise and certify uh, diplomates or whatever they used to call them in the same way that we still certify educators. So I don't, think that that's going to be a relevant conversation, but I'm not the one to ask. Maybe we can pass that off to Terry Kanzanieri or one of the people in AAPC and they can answer it for you. We'd be happy to connect you. So Alex also asked, how will ACPE and AAPC deal with the spiritual vacuity of the, of the business model? The spiritual what of the business model? Vacuity. Acuity? Vacuity. Oh, vacuity. Yes. Well, I'm hoping that this is going to help um, all of us explain more clearly who we are to our institutions. I think, you know, not that this is what you asked, but to, to answer the very first question, to me, this is one of the advantages of um, consolidation is that I think most people out there are confused about what the difference is. And I think most of us within the two organizations are sometimes confused about what's the difference. And I think this gives us a chance to, um, to market and, um, and talk about ourselves to be on the same message, you know, to have our messaging be very clear and specific. And um, this is where the strength of the national team, thank you, John and the rest, um, it's just such a gift and it's part of the appeal for them is how, how much that excellent national team staff has put us forward professionally because the rest of us, let's face it, we all have day jobs and, and we have been able to achieve a level of professionalism because of that 
team down there in Atlanta that we just could not have done otherwise. And I think they're really excited about that too, because they can help us message it more accurately, you know, to the right people. They're paying really close attention to market forces. Um, so I'm excited about that because I think we'll do a better job as a, as a more united front. Just the way the AMA is made up of, of different medical fields that are very, very different from one another. An ophthalmologist cannot do orthopedic surgery and vice versa. And yet they're all together under the AMA because they are stronger together. And I feel like that's gonna be a lot of what starts happening for us. And I hope this is a trial balloon for us as we move toward hopefully consolidating with um, some of our, our other neighbors. Hope that answers it. If not, let us know, we'll answer it later. So I think this is a good uh, question to follow up. Uh, so the question is, in my center, because of the history and context, having ACPE associated with psychotherapy might be viewed as negative by some. I am also working how this association might impact advocating for our CPE program within the health system leadership. How might you explain ACPE's connection to psychotherapy to health system leadership? I don't know that it will come up unless you bring it up. I mean, I don't think most uh, most healthcare systems, I mean, if you've got one that's paying that close attention to ACPE, I'd be tickled pink. Um, mine is not. I mean, <laughs> they know what, they sort of know, but I mean, it, I don't imagine it coming up. And, it, and again, like, much like the AMA, just put it back to them as if the orthopedists want to join the ophthalmologists. And that's really all it is. We're not talking about practicing each other's art form. I don't think it'll have much relevance in the clinical setting, um, unless there happens to be an old, you know, pastoral counseling department in that hospital. If it's a Baptist hospital, it could be. Um, I think it would be very, very specific to the, also to your report structure. I mean, almost everybody I know has a different reporting structure. And I've had four in my 11 years at the clinic. So it depends on who you report to, and it depends on what they know about what we do anyway, which again, I said, if, you, if they know anything about what you're doing, you're kind of lucky. I don't think it's gonna come up unless you bring it up. Uh, do you wanna add anything to that, Melissa? Well, I, I really like the example of the AMA and the power actually that they have um, and how they, sometimes I don't like how they wield it, but um, we are all much stronger together than we are separate. Um, this is the first time that AAPC and ACPE have decided they've talked about it a lot at different times. Um, and I just got some information today that AAPC came out of a came out of the uh, concern that a CPE wouldn't be as concerned about counselors um, or be a place for counselors. And I think that, that we are an association and we do different things. Parts of us do different things, but we are one, we will be, if it all goes through, the referendums go through, we will be one association. And, um, so just like there are pediatric hospitals in ACPE, um, there may be counseling centers in ACPE. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to change my practice in my pediatric facility or what my students do in my pediatric facility. But it may mean they have some extra resources. Right. For our patients, for our families, and mm -hmm. for our students. We were also talking about, you know, in some places being able to utilize uh, AC, AAPC folks, if we had them in the neighborhood, to help with professional advisory committees or interviews or problem, you know, like a student. I know everybody who's been at this more than 10 minutes has accepted a student and then thought, rut row, uh, bigger issues than we uncovered in the interview. <laughs> so having those colleagues um, be like really known to us, um, not just a name on a, a Rolodex. Oh, there, I dated myself. A name on a iPhone, John. I'll tell you what a Rolodex is later. But, but that's, um, <laughs> but having those relationships kind of already in place, I think would be very cool. Okay. Our next question comes from Ruth Alpers. 
Hey, Ruth. <laughs> with, <laughs> with all the governance, certification, and accreditation changes in process with ACP, how does this consolidation proposal contribute to the many changes we are already experiencing? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, it just gives us all more to do. No, actually, I don't think it gives us all more to do. I think that the folks that are coming in to find, you know, new life and new relationships and sort of a new, I think for a lot of them, they could keep practicing. It's not the issue. They can keep doing what they're doing. But the idea of coming into the bigger tent with relatives, cousins, if you will, who are rooted in the same traditions and who are worried about and concerned about the same things in the world, um, the spiritual care of the world, they're going to bring, they're going to bring their own resources to deal with all of that. Um, I don't think we're going to, I don't think we're going to have to do extra work and we're certainly not going to revamp yet again, our whole new structure. I mean, that's, an, that's not for grabs. Um, and nobody can, they're not going to change any of that. Nobody's interested in that. So I think we'll just see what they bring and what they need whether they want to invite ACPE educators onto some of their committees to see if we can cross pollinate some of what they're having to deal with. We just don't know yet, but I don't, I don't feel worried about it. The work, the workload, as we said, they're going to have the, they have the financial resources to pay for their own person. We're not, we're not even going to offload any more work on the national staff. It's going to be someone, we're going to hire someone if it all goes through with their money, to pay for whatever kinds of administrative and organizational things they need help with. And again, just we'll keep reevaluating it going forward. If the money coming in from the number of people joining um, continues to pay for what they need, that'd be great. If it doesn't, then we'll say we tried. I hope that answers that. If not, again, follow up and we'll try to do it later. Well, help, maybe this will help clarify a little bit. Marsha Let asks, we pay unit fees to ACP so we contribute funds. How will former AAPC members contribute funds to ACP on a regular basis once they're members? Membership or, or um, they can contribute to the foundation as they want to, but in terms of rate, they won't be responsible for raising money the way we do. Now, if they are, I mean, by unit, fees or student fees. They don't have anything comparable. I think the curriculum is where they're looking to be marketable. And once the curriculum money starts flowing in, and I think it, I think it just has real promise. I'm very optimistic about that. And I don't think it's like how ACBE is going to become rich and take over the world, but I do think they're going to show that they can bring in money based on what they do. And um, I'm excited about that for them and for us. I think it'll be a real, I think it's some really innovative stuff out there that they have the time and frankly the incentive to perfect in a way that most of us don't have the time or even the incentive because we're already charging for student units um so i think they have some they bring some hunger to the to the situation that we don't necessarily have that will make them come up with some interesting things hope that answers i wish i could awesome. see people <laughs> Our next question comes from John Pumphrey. What is the argument AAPC is making for wanting to join with us? What do they want and what do they say they can bring? What is, what is their case in brief as opposed to our case for or against? Okay. Go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> well, um, first, First and foremost, I believe, first and foremost, their association has, be, has not stayed as strong as ours has because of the lack, as Amy said before, the lack of incentive of being in an association when they pay fees for licensure and to maintain their licenses. So there is a group of them, and we don't know how big it is, who um, are wanting to join us for that, that sense of community and a sense of colleagueship that they have, um, which has become less and less a part of their association. So I think that's first and foremost the thing. 
it has not begun it has begun to not be fiscally feasible for an association to exist when they don't have a continued growth of members um, as we do. And so they want to become part of this association, bring who they are, their gifts, and what they have to offer us for a place in our community, at our table, to be colleagues with them and with each other. Okay, Amy. Yep, that's now it. you got the other part of it. And if I could add just a little bit. Yes, um, please. When their certification was, uh, is, is now not as relevant because they are required to be licensed by their, their state, the new model, business model for maintaining their association would be the development of new curriculum, membership fees, and they still need CE, uh, CEUs. CEUs. So they're required by their state to do CEUs, so they will have motivation to be in community with us at our events, at our conferences, and to, to come to pay for the CEU so that they can maintain their licensure. Yep. Um, which is a, more of a traditional association model, professional association model, when we talk to our association colleagues. ACP is a little unique because of the unit fees, but there, there are other associations doing this type of community and, and education yeah. that, we're, that we're looking at to help bring in AAPC folks. Yeah, and I would just add, and, and this is not to blow you off, John. <laughs> <laughs> This is an honest answer. Like if you look back at the other two recordings, that's almost always the first question um, of the other two town halls. And there may, we may have said it, we may have said more or differently or said it in a different way that if it didn't quite answer your question. It's, it's the bit question that gets most asked. And it's in the written uh, materials and it's in the other two town halls. I think um, because there've been different perspectives on it too. But those are, those are the high points. All right, our next question comes from Denise Hill. At the upcoming ACP national meeting, what conversations reports pertaining to AAPC might be a part of the meeting? Great Will question. AAPC folks be invited to the meeting? Yes, yes, and yes. There, a lot of them are making plans to come. Um, I guess even if we vote not to invite them, um, I think they'll still come. Um, so there's plans definitely for maybe them to have some presence there, not just symbolic, but really be there, um, have maybe a didactic or a symposium or something that's more specifically for psychotherapy. Um, but there's a lot of excitement. I think there were two, as I understand it, there were two regions, they had regions also, and they had two that had remained active enough that they could have continued with their annual conferences uh, for quite some time without running out of money because they didn't do any kind of consolidating of the money at that point. And, um, and they really preferred to try to join, you know, to sort of take the chance and, and hook on to the back of our bigger boat and try to um, try to be part of this in a bigger way. So yes, they're very being very much encouraged to come and hopefully have a, um, you know, their own sort of identity presence, presence there for now. I think for the near future, there'll be some formerly AAPC bracketed kinds of conversation, you know, identifying markers, but, but that's going to drop off pretty fast because they're going to be members of ACPE. They're not going to be, there will be no more AAPC. Um, the only time that'll be referenced will be formerly, formerly known as. So a follow-up question for the CEUs from Ruth Alpers. Based on the question about CEUs, how does ACP license CEUs since ACP does not currently require official CEUs? Wow, I don't know. Maybe Ruth will solve it for us. That, I haven't heard that one. I don't, I don't know. Yet. Well, I get to, from, uh, from our discussions with AAPC folks, they already have a process where they have to apply for CEUs for the different states and organizations when they're planning their various events. So we've already been learning all of those things and that would be something that the, the office staff would take on as part of any event planning. Well, and if, that's, yeah, go ahead, sorry. That's it, yeah. Well, that's great and makes me think that's another real advantage to, to you know, what you ask what's in it for us. And to me, that's huge, not to have to reinvent the wheel for the CEUs. 
All right. Our next question comes from Garrett Starmer. APC and other chaplain organizations are primarily direct practitioners, while ACPE has historically focused primarily on education. Right. In what ways does this move clarify the educational focus of ACPE, and what ways does it cloud the educational focus of ACPE? It's a great question. I think that because we will be the overarching umbrella, the, the uh, you know, I don't know if you've been following Wendy Cadge and the trans, the transforming chaplaincy and all that, but they've come up with this. Wendy has talked about this as sort of a mall approach and that we're the anchor store, you know, that ACPE will always be the, the, the Macy's. <laughs> I don't know where you live, what you have, where you live, but we'll always be the anchor of the, of the whole organization. And, and so, Again, I think it'll be incumbent upon us and the organization as a single unity to, to have that, you know, communicated really clearly. And um, it's just interesting how much, how much real effort it takes to communicate a unified message and have people, one of my hopes going forward, frankly, is that we do have this sort of single source of information. So someone has a question about, gee, what is a chaplain? You know, they call... ACPE, you know, it, what's a professional chaplain and what's the difference between that and then getting something off the internet? Call ACPE. So, and wherever that person's needs to be directed at that point and guided to say, well, these are the educators. These are the on the ground chaplains. These are the on the ground pastor uh, therapists and have there be a, a single sort of one-stop shop for the public to start understanding the complexities of what we do, how much work it really takes to do any of those. <laughs> I mean, we all have years of work, years of education, years of clinical training, years of extra, extras, extras, extras. And none of us rotates in and out of each other's jobs, a therapist or an educator or a chaplain. Um, so I think I'm excited by the possibilities of how we learn to communicate that and, and message it more clearly, but that's, that remains to be seen. It's kind of connected, if I could add, it's a little bit connected to the question about the other, what other kinds of accreditation um, that, we, that we discussed a few weeks ago in one of the emails, one of the newsletters, that, that anybody can accredit things. And there's also accreditation for continuing education that's a lot different from the kind of accreditation that we have for offering graduate level education in major healthcare institutions. But that's just all part of what we'll continue to explain and smart people like John will write it up in bullet points and put it on the website. <laughs> So we don't have any more questions at this point. Is there anything that you two like to, to add? We have about 10 more minutes if we would like a few more questions. It might be nice to um, just remind folks that you will be receiving ballots from Simply Voting. Voting will be open January 30th through Febru February 9th. AAPC will be holding their own election during the same dates. Uh, they are incorporated in Missouri and with Missouri law, they will have to vote on a question of whether to officially dissolve their association. Um, at the same time, ACP will be voting. And do you want to clarify that a little bit more? No. Or do you want me to keep going? Yeah, I think you're doing it. All right. Um, ACP members will also be voting at the same time and it will be a referendum and the the board and the executive committee wants to know, what do you think? Should we invite AAPC to join us? Should we invite them to consolidate with us? Um, the board will take official action following the, the votes, but you know they want member engagement, which is why we've been writing letters and doing our town halls and, um, and we wanna hear from you during that vote. So um, yes. And it's a real vote. <laughs> we're, not, we're not about to, like impose a decision on the membership. I mean, that is not our style and it's not gonna work. So it's a real vote. So please, please, please vote. And please encourage people to vote. Even the people that say, no, it's too scary. I believe in voting. <laughs> so get out the vote. 
<laughs> um, we have a couple thank yous. Uh, Alex Lukens is asking, does anybody know anything about the Barrel Institute and the patient experience movement? Yes. I mean, they, they have been around for a while. Um, I report up through patient experience in my, uh, my hospital and uh, Barrel Institute is one of several that have sort of tried to get out front of what that even means. And uh, I don't know a lot about them because we I have don't have a lot of time to follow them and ours, but they're perfectly legitimate uh, leaders, leaders in the field in terms of connecting spiritual care, especially like they have some experience with, with what we do as it connects to patient experience. So they're definitely uh, quite legitimate, very much worth knowing more about, especially if you report up through patient experience. And I think we'll answer one more question um, from Kidu, sorry, from Kidu on, uh, when AAPC members, former AAPC members coming to ACP, are they also able to join COPs that already exist as a member? I don't Can they yeah. join COP, existing COPs? I think so. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, I don't why know why not. not. Yeah. Yes, that was an easy one. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Actually, this might be a good question to end with. From Kate Kennedy, in some ways, this seems like a step that would set the ground for future collaboration or consolidation with APC, NACC, NAJC, etc. Is this being considered? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Very much so. In fact, in some ways, this is like our uh, clinical trials. You know, uh, it's a clinical trial for AAPC to see if uh, they can uh, get some good results out of it for themselves. And it's a clinical trial for us to see if this idea of consolidation, which frankly, that, that conversation with the chaplaincy cognate organization, that conversation has been in, going on for much, much longer. And so in some ways, it's interesting that we're kind of going around that to put this different group in as maybe the first of what I truly hope will be many. I, I mean, I'll be very clear that, that I, that's my hope and my vision for the future. That being said, I'm not stupid enough to try to push something that the membership doesn't want. So all these things, that's why we're doing so many town halls, printing every single question. We want this completely above board and we definitely want the whole membership or the majority of the membership as much as possible to be behind this. And yes, that would definitely, that's definitely a goal for this, a lot of the same reasons. The cross-pollination, the communication to the wider public about who we are and what we do. Going back to the AMA model, we're stronger if all the medical practices are under one roof than we are if all the different spiritual practices are not under one roof. Um, and I think we've just got, again, great conversations going, great relationships. The spiritual care meetings, our meeting in 2020 will be a, a joint meeting. It'll be in Cleveland, Ohio, so please come. Um, by May, the ice might have melted in the lake, <laughs> but I'm not making any promises. But that meeting is going to be really exciting. It'll be, we'll be inducting our new board chair, Melissa Walker Luckett, and um, and the whole, all the groups will be there anyway for a joint conference. And hopefully, that's where we're headed. But you know, we're just taking this one step at a time, so that we are very response, fiscally responsible, and um, and that the membership is on board all the way. We're not going to compromise all the hard work that we have done. Our organization's in great shape. We've come through some very hard times and we're just in great shape and we've got work to do. I feel super optimistic about what we bring to the world and to healthcare in general and to other institutions. And I am excited and I think we'll do more together. So that's my hope, Be you know, full disclosure, that's my hope. All right, we are done with questions and we're coming up on the hour. So I think we can wrap it up. So thank you and thank you everyone for attending. Please remember you can watch these recordings on YouTube, on ACP's YouTube channel. If we didn't get to your question or you come up with another one, please email me webmaster at acpe.edu and we will get back to you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone.
Bye. Bye. Bye.